Okay, so I'm an academic, you're developers. I use functional languages. Lots of you guys use object-oriented languages? Yes. Yeah? Okay, I'm going to explain why my faith is right and yours is wrong. <laughs> Except, you know, that, that's a sort of awful thing to do, right? There's been a lot of talk about evolution in the news recently, precisely because of um, certain faith-based approaches. Their faith doesn't include evolution. Evolution, I think, is very important. So one thing I'm going to talk about here is how programming languages evolve, how they change. Multiculturalism has been a lot in the news, and so I'm going to talk about multiculturalism. I began by saying, I'm right, you're wrong. That's not very effective. So I want to talk about how we can coexist side by side and learn from each other. And it occurs that I should add another slide. I don't have one that says no culturalism with no symbols on it, um, precisely because certain people would like to maintain their belief in evolution. They've come, people like Dawkins have come to believe that that's incompatible with a belief in faith. So Dawkins goes around and says things like, there is no God, therefore you're all wrong. Um, I agree with him, there is no God, but I'm Jewish. Right? You, can be, you can get a lot out of faith without necessarily believing in God. Um, I will say nothing else about God except at the end. So I want to talk about the origins of my faith, which of course lie in the church. My faith is lambda calculus. Here is the cover of the uh, magazine about uh, Journal of Functional Programming, which I helped found along with John Hughes and Simon Peyton Jones. I come from Edinburgh. There's the pavement of Edinburgh, a city well known for its functional programmers. And that's the tie that I'm wearing right now. So let me tell you a little bit about history. Right? These days, everything is very fast. Funding agencies want results right away. Um, if you're a developer, everybody wants results right away. Um, I'm going to start relatively recently in the story, only in 1935. But in fact, the story goes back much further. Right? The first uses of symbolic logic were people like Boole in the 1800s. You wait a while, and it's codified by Gerhard Gensen. Um, so Gensen came up with the formulation of logic that we use today, called natural deduction. How many people have seen a form of symbolic logic? You're familiar with writing and and or, and maybe even implies, right? Most of you. Um, how many have seen natural deduction? Most of you who've seen logic have seen natural deduction. So this is one of the standard ways of formulating uh, logic, and so the thing on the left says, if assuming A, you can prove B, then you know A implies B. So those brackets around A mean this is an assumption. Um, this says, if you know, have proved A, and you have proved A implies B, then you know B. So this is actually copied out of Genson's paper. Here it is, the full system in Genson's paper. I was just looking in the fragment. Here it is the way we would do it today. You notice this is exactly absolutely the same, except what's in Genson's paper, except his letters are in German and mine are in English. That's the only difference. So this again says, if assuming A, you can prove B, then you know A implies B. And this says, if, oh, I wrote, I reversed the order. Uh, if you know A implies B and you know A, then you can conclude B. Similarly, if you can prove A and you can prove B, then you know A and B. And what do you know if you've proved A and B? You know A and you know B. Now, these rules have a nice form, which is what Genson discovered. He discovered that the proof rules come in pairs. So you have an introduction rule. This is a rule with the th symbol that you're introducing, either implies or and, below the line. And you have elimination rules. These are ones with the symbol above the line. So this says, how do you know A implies B? How do you know A and B? What do you need to know before you know that? And then this says, once you know that, what can you work out? So this is, how do you make one of these things? And this is, what can you do with one of these things? Very nice way of structuring logic. Only took 50 years to work that out. 
to get from Frege's formulation of logic to Genson's formulation of logic. A mere 50 years to discover this completely obvious thing. I want to mention that because I'm sure there are many things that would simplify computing today just as much, completely obvious, and it will take us 50 years to find them. But you know, there might be one, computing's 50 years old. So there will be ideas like that that are 50 years old waiting to be found. The purpose of this talk is to inspire you to find those simple ideas. So here's an example of a proof. Let's see, what have I done here? This is the, um, right, I said for the proof of A and B, these things actually have, A and B has an order, right? So really from A and B, I better be able to prove B and A, right? So um, here is a proof that, assuming B and A, what have I got here? Ah, right, here's the proof I wanted. Um, I want to prove that from B and A, I can prove A and B. That had better be true, right? How do I do that? Well, to prove A and B, I have to prove A and I have to prove B. And indeed, from B and A, Using the one that picks the thing on the right, I can prove A. And using the one that picks the thing on the left, I can prove B. So you notice I've got E1 first and then E0. Now I've got A and B, and then I can discharge my assumption. That's what this is called. So I've assumed B and A, and now I don't need to assume that anymore, but I know that B and A implies A and B. Now let's do the world's most roundabout proof of A and B from the assumptions B and A. So here's the assumption B, here's the assumption A. From those two assumptions, I can prove B and A. And then I know B and A implies A and B, so I've got A and B. Well, wait a minute, that's a very long about, roundabout way of doing it. Can you do that more simply? Of course we can. What we will do is, here I said assume, right, B, from B and A we can do this, we do it with an assumption of B and A. But here I've got a proof of B and A. No need to assume it. I will just get rid of this implication and copy that proof of B and A everywhere I assumed it. So there it is, copied in. So here's one copy, here's another copy. I've made two copies because the assumption is used twice. Um, but now, look, I've done an introduction rule. Notice here, right? I introduced an implication and then I immediately eliminated it. Here I'm introducing an and, and then immediately eliminating it. So why bother to do that? This is, well, from B and A, I can prove B and A, and from that I can get back an A. Let's just use that A directly. Right, so I can simplify, now here's the straightforward proof. Okay, so I took something completely obvious and made your head hurt with it. What is the point of doing that? Well, I mentioned Genson came up with this formulation of logic. Lots of different people were coming up with formulations of logic. There were many different formulations of logic, some of them wrong. Some of them you could prove everything. So it was, which is not a very useful logic. You only want to be able to prove the things that are true. Um, so one of the important things people tried to do with logics is to show that they were consistent. One form of consistency is show you can't prove false. Um, if you go back to Genson's original rules, this is the rule that lets you prove false. If you can prove A and you can prove not A, then you can conclude false. Uh, how did you prove not A? That was the not elimination rule. How could you prove not? Well, from A you can prove false, then you can conclude not A. Now, notice we've introduced a, pr a procedure for simplifying proofs. What this does is by simplifying proofs in this way, you can always get rid of things that are not assumptions or conclusions. So in this proof, we've got some assumptions and a conclusion and nothing in between. You might have a more complicated proof, like this one. That had some assumptions and a conclusion, nothing in between. So this proof alone is in normal form. But when we combine it with this proof, we now have an intermediate formula that's not one of the assumptions, right? The assumptions of this thing are B and A. It's not the conclusion, which is A and B. So we simplify and we simplify and we get something which only has formulas and conclusions. This one only had formulas and conclusions, bigger ones. But we can get rid of them when we combine them with other things. You can always simplify a proof so you have no intermediate formulas. 
That meant that for these rules, right, if you have this in the middle of the proof somewhere, unless you had an assumption like not A, the assumption of not A would have had to come from this, and you'd be able to get rid of it by simplifying. You could simplify down until um, this intermediate bit no longer appeared, and therefore the only proof that's left of false is um, there aren't any. Once something's in normal form, there are no proofs of false, right? Because the, the proof would have to involve the subformulas of false. False has no subformulas. It's like, what part of no don't you understand, right? There are no subparts of false. So in this way, Genson showed the consistency of his logic. That was why he was interested in proof normalization. That was one reason. Okay. By the way, he didn't do it directly. He had to prove another thing, sequent calculus, also the other main logic that we use to this day. So they both lasted 50 years. He did both of these in his PhD thesis, by the way. Also introduced the upside down A to mean for all, all in one paper. Um, and so he came up with all these ideas. So that's the first part of the story. Here's the second part. This is the church I mentioned, Alonzo Church. He invented the lambda calculus, also because he was interested in logic. There is, um, where is it? There is the very first lambda. Uh, as used in lambda calculus. So this is the paper that introduces lambda calculus. And you remember I said some logics ended up being inconsistent. He, ended up, he introduced lambda as a very powerful way of writing functions in logical formulas. Um, but it made his logic inconsistent. Turned out the way to make it consistent again was to introduce these things that um, Bertrand Russell, we're on Russell Square, um, this Russell Square is not named after Bertrand Russell. It's named after one of his ancestors. But Bertrand Russell um, introduced, he came up with Russell's paradox, which was the main ways in which a logic can be inconsistent. And he got rid of Russell's paradox by introducing these things he called types. So types were originally introduced in order to make logics consistent. And this is how uh, Church used it as well. So Church was interested in lambda expressions. So here's the lambda expression x with term u. Um, and let's look at the type of this. So this is a function from A to B. So it means the argument is of type A and result is of type B. We saw this in the other talk, except I wrote this backward C as an error. So this should actually look familiar just a slightly different notation. And so that top line there says, assuming variable x has type A, I can conclude that term u has type B. So that means x appears as a free variable somewhere in the term u. And then lambda x u would be a function from A to B. If s is a function from A to B, and t is a term of type A, then of course s applied to t will have the function's result type, B. So this is just function application. This is function creation. They come in pairs. What about pairs themselves? So if t is a term of type A and u is a term of type B, then t u is a pair, and we'll write its type like that, A and B. Now we see why the order in A and B is important, right? Because um, clearly a u t pair is isomorphic to a, one of these, but not the same. Um, so of course, if s is one of these terms, we can extract its left component or its right component. So its left component will have type A, its right component will have type B. So these are just typing rules. Uh, let's say we've got some program. This is sort of the simplest program I could think of. It's the one that given a BA pair returns an AB pair. So what does that do? It will take Z, which is your BA pair. It will take its right component, which is a, um, an A, and its left component, which is a B. So that gives you back an AB pair. So there it is. So there's the proof that this term has this type. Now if I've got free variables, x and y, of types a and b, I can form a yx pair, which of course would be b and a. I can apply the function. So how do you do function application? Well, this says for any z, um, you can build up this term. Well, here's 
a particular actual term that I want to use for the formal z, so you just substitute it, right? So we can copy that up. And when we copy it, you notice we get the proof that doing the substitution remains well typed. So now we've replaced z both places by this pair. And of course, we can simplify that by picking out the correct components, and we get the answer, as you expected. So here were two different things done by two different logicians for completely different reasons, but they kind of look really similar, don't they? Right? In fact, if you reach underneath your seat, you'll find that I've placed there rose-colored glasses. You can put those on. Wearing rose-colored glasses, you'll see the red, the blue will disappear, and uh, sorry, you'll see the blue, the red will disappear, and you'll see that this looks exactly like the logical proof. So completely obvious, right? So just as you would expect with something completely obvious, right? Those other things were 1935, 1940. It only takes 40 years. And William Howard publishes the paper pointing out this completely obvious correspondence that I've just shown you. And it's now called the Curry-Howard isomorphism because in a slightly different form, um, Haskell Curry had already noticed this in 1950, I think it was actually 1956, the year I was born. So what was proved here by Curry and Howard is that you should expect that every good type system has a double-barreled name. So Curry-Howard is a double-barreled name that predicts the existence of other double-barreled names. Um, not in the sense of Peyton Jones, where you've got one person that has two names stuck onto him, <laughs> but in the sense of a type system which has two names stuck onto it because it was discovered twice, once by a computer scientist and once by a logician. And so you've got the Hindley-Milner system, um, discovered by the logician Roger Hindley and the computer scientist Robin Milner. This is the basis for the type system in Haskell and many other languages. When I talked about parametric polymorphism, this is how we do it. Um, and in fact, that generalizes to something else called the girard reynolds type sy system, discovered by the logician Jean-Yves Girard and the computer scientist John Reynolds. Exactly isomorphic systems. Both of these were discovered within a few years of each other. Always the logician gets there first. So I want to show you something coming from this last system, the girard reynolds system. And I want to show how that relates both to Haskell and to other languages like John. Half. So I mentioned that Gensen introduced for all. Um, so here again is the, sorry, I mentioned, Gensen introduced I mentioned that Gensen introduced the symbol for all. But the idea of quantification was older. Again, about 50 years older. It was first introduced by uh, Peirce in the US and by Gottlob Frege in um, Europe. So here, and Frege, I think, was the first one to write it down. So here's Frege's uh, introduction of um, quantification. Frege used, so, this weird thing here, that weird diagram, is how um, Frege wrote A implies phi of A. And if he wanted um, a quantifier, he put a little dip in the line and wrote the bound variable in that dip. So he had a graphical notation, but it was basically the idea of quantification as we know and love it today. So this is how he would prove a formula hold for all little a. Um, Now, if you wait many years, um, John Reynolds comes up with a little type system explained here um, called the polymorphic lambda calculus. And he wrote the types, actually, you can't see this, right? but there's the type. This is what we would now write for all TW, but he wrote it as a delta. The reason he wrote it as a delta is he didn't know his type system corresponded to a logic yet. So now I want to show you a magic trick 
So do I not have? Okay, I don't have the other paper by Girard, but Girard did know corresponded to a logic and did write the same thing with a for all. But let me just explain this to you with a magic trick. So here's a function r, and its type is for all a, there should actually be a for all a in front here, given a list of a, return a list of a. So this is the way we write it in Haskell, although these days in Haskell we learn better, and you can also put in the for all a if you want to. So I should have done that. But here's a function r, and type list of a to list of a for any a. Okay? So there are various functions on lists that you can write that don't have this type. For instance, consider the function that um, takes a list and subtracts one from everything in the list. Well, that would work for list of integers and list of floats, but it would not work for um, list of strings because subtracting one from a string has no meaning. But this works for all a, so it can't be that function. So I want you to think of a function that takes a list of a to a list of a. Don't tell me what it is. Okay, no, I've got nothing up my sleeves. Okay, are you thinking of your function of this type? Now that you're thinking of it, I will read your minds. And I have divined a theorem which is satisfied by your function r. Here's the theorem. Start, yes. Start with your list of A, apply map F to it for any F whatsoever to give you uh, there's a typo here. Damn. See that A? That's misspelled. It's B. See that B? It's misspelled. It's A. Okay. So modulo of the typo. This is very easy to understand. Apply this function f, which takes an A to a B, to a list of A, and of course you get a list of B. Apply r at type A to a list of A, and you get the rearranged list of A. Apply r to your list of B at type B, and you get the rearranged list of B. Then, if you take the rearranged things and map f again, over them, you get back to the same place. Let me show you one example. Here's a list of numbers, 97, 98, 99. For R, let's see. Okay, now here's the real magic. How many of you were thinking of the function reverse? Quite a few. How many of you um, were thinking of a different function? Wow, that never happens. What function were you thinking of? Sorry? Identity, right, an even simpler function. Okay, good. How many of you are thinking of no function at all? Only one person admits to it. Okay, so let's take reverse, because identity is a bit too simple. Um, so 97, 98, 99, you reverse it, you get the orders and numbers in reverse order. Character is a function that takes a number to its um, corresponding character in the ASCII character code. So we take 97, 98, 99, and we get ABC. Um, we reverse the first thing, we get a list of numbers. Reverse the characters, we get the reverse list of characters. Indeed, if we take these list of numbers and reverse it, we get this list of characters. So the identity function satisfies this. The reverse function satisfies this. Anybody thinking of a function that wasn't reverse or identity? Yes? Um, color. 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 Oh, what does that do? Oh, tail, cutter, right. Um, tail, okay, let's try it with tail. 97, 98, 99. Take its tail, would be 98, 97. Take the characters, you get A, B, C. Take the tail, you get B, A. I read your mind. You may all now applaud. <laughs> right? I won't show you the proof of this, but the, basically the way you prove it is you take Let's go way back. There's a variant for impure function. But the way you prove it is you take one of these proof trees showing that a given term has a given type, and you can convert that into a proof tree showing that the given thing satisfies um, the relevant theorem. So it's actually remarkably straightforward to prove this magical property. Um, so this is great, right? It means 
Polymorphism isn't just incredibly useful, right? It lets you write one function that can sort list of characters and list of integers and list of strings and so on, once you add type classes, uh, which fit in with this perfectly. Um, so polymorphism is a wonderful thing. So when Java came along, we thought, damn, it doesn't have generic types. What would Java look like if you added generic types? So Martin Odersky and I um, put polymorphism into uh, pizza, and then we showed how to translate that to bog standard Java. And basically, if you've got something polymorphic in a type, in this case, element, LM is what I was calling A before, what you do is just you replace it everywhere by object. In fact, this is what happens, right? People before generic would always write things in terms of objects. So if you want a list that could be of any type, it would be a list of object. And right, object is perfectly named. Right? If you see something like list of object, you should object. <laughs> People have used object because they didn't have polymorphism or generics available. So we showed how you could add polymorphism, but map it back into existing Java. And um, there was a lot of work that we then did to turn that into, well, first of all, I came up um, working with Benjamin Pierce and Natsushi Igarashi. We came up with a formal model of Java so that we could prove all this. There were, at the time, lots of formal models that tried to capture as much of Java as you could formally. So almost every single feature of Java was captured formally. We did the opposite. We made a formal model of Java that was as small as we could make it. So here is Java in a little bit, you know, fits comfortably on one slide. Um, and both of these things are important to do, but the advantage of making it as simple as possible is then other people can do the same thing. So lots and lots of people would then design additions to Java and model it formally starting from this system, which was, we made it as simple as possible, so we called it featherweight Java. So um, I, I highly recommend two things. One, formalize. Two, make your formalism absolutely as simple as you can. Don't try to capture everything. Try to capture the essential bits. Um, so it only changes a little bit when we added generics to it. And we could capture generics, and we could formally capture the idea of replacing generic type variables by object and showing that that all worked. And then um, we worked very hard Martin and I collaborating with the people at Java to get generics in that design actually into uh, the Java language. And it was about, it's a, it takes a long time to evolve a language. So it was like 10 years before we first figured out how to put generics in Java and between them actually getting in there. And this gets us back to evolution again, right? Evolution is slow, but also in order to get generics into Java, we had to design the, um, it's called the erasure mapping. This is the thing that replaces the type for all A by object so that you can implement it on the existing Java virtual machine. And the rule was the Java virtual machine couldn't change. And the rule was old library should work well with new code. New code should work well with old libraries. Old libraries, you should be able to replace them by newer libraries that have better generic types. So setting everything up so that that worked neatly, that was the hard part. So um, if you want to try to add something to an existing language, you often have to work extra hard. Right? It's not just a matter of designing the new feature, but fitting it to what was there before. So I think it was very helpful that we had Haskell as a model of what we did with Java, because just doing it with Java directly would have been too hard. Um, oh, and that's the advertisement. Literally, the representative from O'Reilly, who's here, has copies of the book, and she said, put this in your talk and tell them that there's a signing after the talk. So there's a signing at the O'Reilly desk immediately after the talk. Please show up, because they sent very few books, and I want to embarrass them. <laughs> there are only six copies. So if we can sell six copies, the next time I can say, see, you should send more copies. OK. Um, I want to briefly review three recent ideas. 
right? I mentioned that you should, I mentioned that type classes go well with parametricity. I didn't tell you how they go, right? But what free theorem should you get from sort? So sort takes a list of A to a list of A, but it's not any list of A. It's only A's that belong to the type class ORD. Right? The type class ORD defines less than what you need to do sort. So it doesn't work for any type, but works for any type that has less than defined on it. So now the theorem you get should look almost exactly like the theorem for re reverse. Right? It should say, if you take a list of A and sort it to get a list of A, then mapping and sorting should be interchangeable. And if you think about for a moment, that will be true as long as this function f preserves order. And saying function f, instead of saying for all f, we now say for all f that preserve order. Preserving order corresponds exactly to saying the type variable a belongs to the order type class. It has one operation, less than, less than the meaning of um, x less than y had better be related to the meaning of f of x less than f of y. So if f preserves ordering, then you can apply a function and sort, or sort and apply a function. So you get strong theorems from the type classes. So what this says is everything in the type class, as long as all those functions are preserved, your properties are preserved. So that's a strong precondition, right? You want as few things to be preserved as possible. So just having less than as your precondition for ORD is good. You don't want to have other preconditions like, oh, as long as it's a type that you can do ordering on and can print, convert to a string. Because now your theorem would say it's, pre it's true for any function that preserves less than and preserves print. How many functions preserve print? Well, let's see. That says that x, print of x and print of f of x should be the same. Um, and how many functions do that? Well, usually, two, so two things print is the same only if they're equal. So the only f that works there is the identity function. That's the only one that preserves print in general. So having print in the set of things that should be preserved is a bad idea. So what happens in object-oriented languages when you quantify over things? You don't quantify in general. The thing that corresponds to the type classes is, as you say, you quantify over everything that's a subtype of some other type, like comparable. So ORD is like subtype of comparable. And comparable only has in it the ordering function and everything that's an object. What's an object? Oh, just a few things like equality and hash and print. Oh. So as long as it preserves everything in comparable, which means it preserves everything in object, which means it preserves print, which means it is the identity function, then this theorem holds. Okay. So by making all type subtypes of object, you get these three theorems that are completely useless. So this is the second reason you should object to object, which is it's got too much stuff in it. Yeah, sometimes it's nice to have print. Sometimes it's nice to have hash. But you'd like to be able to say, no, I've got nothing at all. I know nothing about this. Knowing nothing is very powerful. So you'd like to be able to say, I know nothing. So we need a new type in the next generation of object-oriented languages called top that has absolutely no methods. Okay, so when you go off and design your next object-oriented language, please make sure that there's a type that has no methods in it whatsoever. That combined with generic types buys you a lot. You can tell I'm a types kind of guy. Right? Half the people in the world are types kind of people, and half the people in the world are, so half the people are statically typed, half the people are dynamically typed. Languages like Clojure, Scheme, JavaScript, Ruby, Python, all of those are dynamically typed. They only do the type checking at runtime, not statically at compile time. It'd be nice to make these two guys live together. Uh, and I've been doing some work on that. It's something called the Blaine calculus. Again, it's a very tiny calculus. The reason I'm saying this is I keep thinking that somebody should do the following. Um, well, I shouldn't be lazy. I should do it, except I'm not very good at JavaScript. I'm not very good at what developers do. So I'm hoping to persuade one of you to do this. If you're interested, please come see me. Using just these few lines, 
we can do the following. You can take a JavaScript program, say, here are its types and then turn it into something that at runtime confirms that it has those types. So no static type checking, but at least at runtime, we're confirming that things have these types. So now if you import somebody else's library and you give these type declarations for it, and it turns out you guessed wrong about what the types were, you will find out at runtime. So now you can combine existing JavaScript programs in a much more robust way. So that's a good thing to do. Remember this free theorem that I gave you about for all types? So um, there's a successor paper to this one that shows the free theorem that you get from for all types. You can take an untyped JavaScript program, free of side effects, give it this type, and guarantee that it satisfies that theorem. How cool is that? Right, so you really do get theorems for free just by imposing a type on something. So I think this would be a cool thing to do. I'm very excited about it. I will go off and do it, but somebody here is interested in helping me write a library for JavaScript or Python that helps you do that sort of thing. Um, I think that'd be a cool project. I'll skip over the third idea so I can spend a moment telling you about aliens. So, I mentioned that my faith is founded on the lambda calculus. In fact, my faith is founded on the idea that for every type system, there should be a corresponding logic. Um, this turns out to be true for everything except concurrency. This third idea that I didn't show you is recent work showing, hey, maybe it works for concurrency as well. So what is a consequence of this faith? Well, the way I like to put it is to say, lambda calculus is God's programming language. But in polite company, one shouldn't mention God. So what is a different way of saying this? Let's talk about aliens. Let's say we want to communicate with aliens. We have actually tried to communicate with aliens, right? This is the um, plaque that's on the Voyager, um, not the Voyager from Star Trek, but the actual Voyager uh, satellite, which looks like this thing in the background. And then they put pictures of people in the front, and then, um, this is to communicate where the Earth is. These are all different pulsars. Um, the length of the line is their distance from our solar system. There are marks on these lines, which are in binary, which is the frequency of the pulsar, so you can identify the pulsar. So this is telling them exactly where the Earth is. And then they can, now I figure any aliens will be able to understand this bit. It will depend on what their visual system is, whether this bit makes any sense to them at all. Right? If Star Trek turns out to be right, they'll look at that and they'll say, wow, they look exactly like us. <laughs> Except they don't have pubic hair. <laughs> um, or maybe they'll look at this and not make sense of it. Or maybe they'll look at this and go, mmm, they look tasty. They're over there. Let's go. <laughs> not clear what will happen. But this is how you communicate with aliens. Now, some bits we're sure aliens will understand. Lengths, they better understand. Binary notation, they will certainly understand. This bit, not clear if they'll understand it or not. OK, well, now let's look in movies. Here's a movie called Independence Day. The aliens come to Earth and conquer it. And of course, they are destroyed by a virus, a computer virus. What programming language was that computer virus written in? Well, here's the screen. I'm afraid it's a bit um, messy. But if you look at it, you can see that it's written in a dialect of C. Right? It's got lots of curly braces in it. It's, it's a strange dialect of C that only has open braces, but not closed braces. <laughs> uh, and at the time, I had just gone to work that this movie came out. I had just gone to work at Bell Labs. I was working down the hall from um, Kernigan and Ritchie and uh, Ken Thompson. And I thought, wow, how cool is that? Something that my colleagues did got into a popular movie. How did I know this wasn't Java? This was 1996. Java had been invented. But if you think back to 1996, that was before Java had spread through the known universe. So I figured it was C. Now, how likely is it that you can program alien computers in C? Maybe not very likely. How likely is it that aliens would know lambda calculus? Well, all you need to ask is, how likely is it that they would know natural deduction and modus ponens? Right? If they know 
modus ponens, then they must know lambda calculus, which is isomorphic. So you couldn't communicate with them by sending them a C program. I think that'd be really hard. They'd spend a long time decoding it. But sending them lambda calculus? Absolutely. So there's just one thing about this. Um, right, I said, so anywhere in the universe, right, you could go and communicate with aliens using lambda calculus. So I'd like to say lambda calculus is universal, but I think that's restricting things a bit too much. Because if you think about it, you might have alternate universes. Even in alternate universes, they will know natural deduction and the law of modus ponens. I find it really hard to imagine. I can easily imagine a universe with, say, a different gravitational constant, but I cannot easily imagine a universe without lambda calculus. So I'd like to say lambda calculus is universal, but that's too restricted. So I had to invent a word. Lambda calculus is omniversal. So I'm done now. I would just like to remind you in conclusion that right, the way to make your programming language work is to have a simple theory underneath it. Right? Lambda calculus has a very simple theory. It's very powerful. What you should think when you've got a hard problem, what you should think is this is a job for lambda calculus. <laughs>
they will understand about generics from the start and get it right. Um, I, I mentioned John Reynolds in the talk. Um, he moved to Carnegie Mellon and started teaching there just after James Gosling and I graduated. James Gosling, who did Java, was actually in the office next to mine. Um, fortunate, so I didn't learn about it as a graduate student. I learned about it later. James, unfortunately, never learned about it. So when he did the design, he got it wrong. Right? You can all learn polymorphic lambda calculus, and when you design your languages, get it right from the start. So we won't have these infelicities. See, um, by the way, we did it by erasure so that we had good backwards compatibility properties. C Sharp did it not using the erasure, using something else called reification. That makes some things work more smoothly, but gives them horrible backwards compatibility. So you sort of just have to choose which bit is going to be awful. Um, it's nice that you can retrofit it, but it's even better to get it right from the start. So um, I'm pleased that generics are in Java, but the reason I'm most pleased is I hope from them being there and in C Sharp and in a few other languages, people will learn about them, and then the next languages they design will get it right from the start. Yeah. <clears throat> It, it's a very general question, but what do you think about Scala? What do I think about Scala? So, I've, of course, I mentioned Martin Oderski and that we worked on pizza together, and then Martin went on and did Scala. And, um, yes, yeah, Scala has a huge number of brilliant ideas in it. Um, all, if I would criticize Scala, I would criticize it by saying it has too many brilliant ideas in it. It's sort of like throwing in the kitchen sink. Um, but um, I think Scala is a very interesting language to look at. Um, I think that Simon actually got it exactly right in his slide where he was saying, you know, look, you want laboratories for exploring with type systems. And he said, Haskell, Haskell's way ahead in doing strange things. And just beneath it, he wrote Scala. Scala has some really interesting experimenting with type systems in it, in particular looking at merging functional type systems with object-oriented type systems and showing you can use that to do things that are hard to do with either one alone. Okay, I think we are we are kind of out of time now. If we need to get to the next, uh, um, feel free to double me during the day and ask exactly. questions. Exactly. You'll also be here tomorrow. Uh, I should be here for some of tomorrow as well. Okay, perfect. Thank you very much. Thank you.